Hey class, what's going on? Uh, this is the second part of History 1301 uh, video. And what I'm going to be doing now is we're going to be settling the colonies. Okay? We're not going to go as far as the revolution in this unit. We're going to go right up to the uh, Enlightenment and the Seven Years' War. We're not going to cover the Seven Years' War and we're not going to cover the Enlightenment. We're going to go right up to it. Again, uh, this is June, uh, July 14th of uh, 2020, the year of COVID for uh, future students. Uh, and I am in the comfort of my uh, shed. Uh, I refuse to call it a man shed because my children and my wife can come in here. Uh, so I'm in the comfort of my shed and I'm gonna get started with this lecture for History 1301, Unit 1, Part 2. And remember, if you like the video, press like and subscribe to my channel. I do not make any money, but I just want more people to use these videos if they can. Now, we're going to start with, of course, the, the, the first country that does any significant settling in North America that is recognized is, of course, uh, the United Kingdom or England. Okay. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the Spanish and the French are not here. Remember, the, by the time that the English come, the Spanish have been in Texas and have been in Florida and uh, California, Arizona, and New Mexico. And uh, individuals uh, that have explored have gone as far north as Wyoming. You know, so there is a contingency or settlers, Spanish settlers that are living in the what we call the Hispanic Southwest, you know, uh, San Agustin, Florida, is is settled by the Spanish, and you know we're gonna have Ponce de Leon, we're gonna have uh, 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 Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca that is gonna walk across Texas and bring the first African slave to Texas. His name is Estebanico. Uh, we're gonna have the murderous explorer Hernando de Soto. And he's going to go to like Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, and he eventually dies in Arkansas, but he covers like five states, okay? And then, of course, we're going to have Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, okay? His wealthy wife gave him some money, and he explored, uh, he was in, in search of the seven cities of Cibola, and he uh, goes into uh, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, uh, Colorado, Wyoming, uh, uh, New Mexico, and Arizona. And he's the one that gives the Sierra Nevadas, or the Sierra Nevadas, the name the Sierra Nevadas. You can, can see him in the distance, and he says, Allá están las Sierra Nevadas. Over there is the Sierra Nevadas. And there is some speculation that he may have named Colorado also <clears throat> because of the sunset. If in your lifetime you have the opportunity to watch a sunset in Colorado, you absolutely need to do so, okay? Because they are, they are spectacular and even more spectacular than they are in Texas. So you may want to, you may want to do that. <clears throat> okay, so you know the only thing I want students to do is that I want students to recognize that prior to English settlement, there were other countries that had settled. You know, we have the French that settled. Uh, the discover the Mississippi. We have Robert Cavalle, Sui de la Sal. We have uh, Marquette and uh, I forgot his name now. Uh, Jolet and I'm sorry, students, I have forgotten. Uh, yes, it was Marquette and Jolet, and then of course we have Champlain, and again, like I mentioned, Robert Cavalle, Sui de la Sal who eventually perishes uh, in the area of Navasota, Texas. You know, he, he gets in an argument with his men over who had killed a deer, and they shoot him. It didn't help that he was arrogant as hell. Um, anyway, um, so that's what I want to point out. The Dutch are also here, okay? Uh, the Dutch also come in, and, uh, of course, they are going to settle New Amsterdam, which eventually is going to become New York. Uh, and eventually we begin to have joint stock companies that are going to come in. Uh, there's going to be a time of relative uh, 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 upheaval in, in England between 1603 and 1688. 
where you're going to have the English Civil War and eventually a king is going to get beheaded and a lot of individuals leave. Some individuals had already left in 1620 on the Mayflower uh, when uh, Queen Elizabeth was uh, queen there. The Puritans left because the Puritans felt that the that the uh, uh, Anglican Church was not purified enough so uh, you know Queen Elizabeth kind of said well you're creating too many problems for me and I really don't want to put you to death so you can go ahead and go now remember prior to that Mary Tudor had persecuted Protestants and they call her the reason they call her Bloody Mary is because you know she put so many to death I really apologize about the glare on my glasses and trying to see if I can find a way to not get glare on my glasses but it's not working out real good you know, I have to work on things like that it's probably the light behind me uh, anyway <clears throat> now what's gonna happen is that none of these colonies are actually going to be settled by uh, 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 individuals that are gonna do it on their own the only the only ones that are really gonna do that are gonna be the Puritans okay and the Puritans are, are different. They're actually, I would say, special. They are uh, different than everybody else uh, because when they come to the New World, they get rid of everything they have, okay? And these people are well-educated. They're lawyers, they're doctors, they're teachers, they're priests. They're not individuals that, for example, are leaving because of hardship. They're leaving because they're in search of religious freedom. Not for everybody. They're in search of religious freedom for themselves. And uh, <clears throat> they're not very tolerant to other, to other religions, you know, and we're going to talk about them in a minute. Uh, now, the colonies are divided into uh, four distinct regions, which is the Chesapeake, which is going to be Georgia and the Carolinas. And then you're going to have New England colonies, which is basically going to be you know, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Delaware, New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm forgetting one there. And the middle colonies, which are going to be New York, Pennsylvania, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, New York and Pennsylvania, uh, and then uh, the Lower South. I think I said the Chesapeake. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I messed up. The Lower South is Georgia and the Carolinas. The Chesapeake is actually the area of Chesapeake Bay, I'm sorry, um, which is pretty much the area of Maryland and Virginia where you have that natural harbor that goes in there. And there's going to be a lot of political unrest there with Bacon's Rebellion and stuff like that. It's going to be an area where uh, there's going to be a lot of commerce and a lot of trade, but there's also going to be a lot of unrest, okay? Now, uh, the first they, the first area they try to settle, uh, of course, is the Chesapeake, and that's done in 1584 with the settlement of Roanoke. The problem is that we don't know what happened to Roanoke. They basically came and they dropped off some some settlers there, and the next thing you know, they come back a year later and they're gone. They somebody scratched uh, into a tree, pro something to the expelled of Croatian or Croton. Uh, they did see some. Indians or Native Americans that resembled, you know, uh, Anglo-Americans. So they probably thought that some of these uh, co colonists had been uh, taken in by the Al Algonquin communities of the area, but but we don't know. Now, in 1607, the Virginia Company, of course, settles Jamestown, and Jamestown is going to be a disaster from the get-go. Okay, uh, you're going to have in 1609, 1610, you're going to have starving time. These people don't come prepared to survive they come prepared to look for gold so they're not in tune with the seasons they're not in tune with the environment i mean here these people are starving to death in the middle of a area that is full of of, of food because they don't know what to eat how to eat it and when to start saving okay um and in between 1609 and 1610 they resort to eating dogs, they eat cats, they eat roots, and then when they start eating acorns, I think that's when it goes bad, because acorns contain, uh, I'm not sure, I think it's either small amounts of natural strychnine or arsenic, but it creates delirium, and it gives them really bad stomach pains, and they start eating their own excrement, and then one man uh, kills his wife and consumes 
uh, the corpse and uh, uh, removes the fetus and eats the fetus. She actually salts her so she won't spoil and everybody's like, well, why hasn't Bob over there lost any weight? Well, let's go find out. He must have a cow or something in his cellar and they go in there and they find his wife and they burn him at the stake, you know, because of... Uh, and there's a big question of, uh, of did, you know, according to what I've read, most of the Indians in the Americas did not practice cannibal dietary cannibalism. They they practiced uh, what we call as ritualistic cannibalism, and because they practiced ritualistic cannibalism, uh, and you need to read up on ritualistic cannibal, know the difference between dietary cannibalism and ritualistic cannibalism. The only tribe that 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 did practice dietary cannibalism in the Americas were the Aztec. Uh, 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 all the other tribes did uh, uh, ritualistic cannibalism. So this even shocked the Indians. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, they're like, you know, uh, they're using it as a protein source. Okay. Now, what happens here is that they declare martial law. Okay. And I mean, they're dying, they're dropping like flies here. I mean, they they not, can't make it. They're, it's like they're, they're, they're drowning of thirst in the middle of the ocean kind of scenario then they get sideways with the uh, indians the powhatans and that doesn't help them out either now eventually the war powhatan war is ended with the wonderful disney story of you know pocahontas and john rolfe which is just wrong right to even i was joking okay and in 1618 uh they come up with the head right system and the, the house of burgesses which is really the first governing body that we have in the united states uh, the first colonial governing body in the United States in 1618. Now, in 1620, we're going to have the Pilgrims come in, and they're going to have a governing body as well, which is is, is going to be the Mayflower Compact, okay? But still, you know, 1619, 1623, Jamestown is mail-laden. They're not doing any good. Eventually, by 1623, the Virginia Company gives up. It goes bankrupt, and uh, the king takes over... Uh, the Virginia colonies and it becomes a royal colony. Now, Maryland, which is, you know, uh, adjacent to to uh, Virginia is is going to be a colony, but it's going to be a religious uh, a religious experiment and it that colony is going to be uh, a Catholic haven. It's going to be uh, founded uh, under the Calvert family, uh, Sir George Sir, uh, Sir George Calvert and uh, he's going to pass away. He's going to die. And he gives the charter to his son, Cecilius, under Charles I. Now, there's going to be problems when Charles I gets beheaded. Okay? Now, the problem is, is the Catholics didn't want to go there. It's like, you know, pretty much religious turmoil in, in Europe by now had already glossed over. The problems now were civil with between Parliament and, and the monarchy. There was some issues, but... Ah, you know, not enough to make one of people say, like, I'm going to get all my stuff and I'm going to cross the ocean and, and just start anew. Uh, <clears throat> now, what happens here is that it attracts a, a bunch of Protestants, not Catholics. Now, Protestants didn't like Catholics, okay? They didn't consider them Catholic. They didn't consider Catholics Christians because they were idol worshipers and they had a pope and all the above. And then the other thing that happens is that when the settlers that come into Maryland get there, they start planting tobacco, and that's what they're planting in Virginia. <laughs> so they, so people from Virginia start going to Maryland, and they start burning these tobacco plantations, and then they get really pissed off in Maryland, and they go to Virginia, and they burn tobacco plantations. So you don't have any toleration going on here. You've got religious turmoil going on. You've got economic turmoil going on. And then you've got infighting within the colony between Protestants and Catholics. So it's not like the colonists are getting here and they're holding hands and singing Kumbaya. I mean, these people are as different as night and day. And they're miserable because they just realize that they don't even want to be here. Okay, now, eventually what happens with Maryland is when a civil war breaks out in, in uh, England in the 1640s, uh, George Calvert issues an act of toleration. Okay, he says, "Look, we're not going to follow the what's going on in England, and we're going to tolerate each other." And Oliver Cromwell says, "No, you're not. You don't have the authority to do that. And I'm going to send somebody to take the colony away from you and make it a royal colony 
And in that process, Cromwell dies, and it's like, oh, cool, so now nothing's going to happen, so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to go back to the way it was. That's what we're going to do, but it doesn't go back to the way we were. What happens is, is that the Stuarts are ushered in. It's a glorious revolution. William and Mary come in, and a guy by the name of John Coode C-O-O-D-E leads the Protestants in a rebellion in Maryland and eventually <clears throat> William and Mary get really pissed off and they say, you know what, it's just going to be a royal colony since you guys can't get along. And that's what's going to happen, okay? That's what's going to happen eventually. Now, <clears throat> what starts happening during the reign of William and Mary is that you're going to have a lot of settlers that are going to come in. They're going to start coming in. <clears throat> and a lot of the good land on the Chesapeake is going to be taken up. And you're going to start to have some problems because they're going to settle further inland, maybe 15 or 20 miles at max, right? Just say, for example, that you live in Fort Worth and you can't find land in Fort Worth, so you you buy you buy some land in Burleson or in, you know, in just a little outskirt, all right? And a lot of these people start settling there, and these people are really cool because they manufacture various and sundry goods shoes soap candles tallow you know you name it they there's a system called the putting out system where everybody would put out something you know you may slaughter hogs and you may sell all the fat to the guy that renders the tallow and then he sells the tallow and the refined fat to the people that make candles and the people that make soap uh, and then after you skin the hog then he sells the hide to the guy that cures the hides and once the hides are cured then he can sell hides to the guy to the leather smith and somebody he can sell some hides to the cobbler and that's the way this system works i mean just because he's got hogs doesn't mean that he is producing the hogs and making the hams and making the bacon and making everything no <clears throat> he's getting that hog and breaking it down and putting it out so then those individuals can put out other goods to stimulate the economy and it works great okay another thing that happens in this region is virginia is famous for its hams what we're going to have here is that we're going to have an industry where you have to preserve those goods bacon hams and stuff like that so that's going to create another industry now here's where it's going to start a problem when these people what they trade amongst themselves their surplus what they do with their surplus or actually they trade their surplus what they do with their stuff is that they take it to jamestown when they're going to jamestown they get attacked sometimes and when they get attacked <clears throat> it's either bandits or indians that attack them they tell the governor why aren't you providing us any help why aren't you protecting us why are these roads really crappy you know, the Indians are attacking us, the bandits are attacking us, and we're bringing these goods to you. You're buying these goods from us, and then you're sending them to England, and you're making a ton of money. You're actually making more money than we are. So we demand that you either give us permission to kill the Indians and the bandits, or that you give us help. Well, the governor, which is Governor Berkeley, says, no, you don't have permission to kill anybody. You're just going to listen to me. Be quiet, and let me see what I can do. Now, what does Berkeley do? He does absolutely nothing, right? Because, I mean, he lives at the governor's mansion. He's Governor Berkeley, you know? I mean, he's, you know, powdered wig and, you know, pantyhose, that kind of dude, you know? So he refuses to aid the Westerners. Now, Nathaniel Bacon, and Nathaniel Bacon didn't sell bacon commercially, he rounds up about 500 men. Most of these people are illiterate, they are not, you know, I'm not going to say that they're not smart, but they're just not like, they're illiterate, okay? And they march on Jamestown. And what do they do? Well, what people that riot do. They burn stuff, right? I mean, recently we've been pretty upset because of the riots and the burning and the looting that's going on. You must remember one thing. When people burn and riot and loot it, or when they riot and loot and burn, they do it because that stuff, those things that they're destroying, is representative of those individuals that have wealth. So it's 
they don't even care if they're burning their own apartment what they're doing it's a symbolic gesture of saying this is how we feel about what you have it's not mine so i'm going to burn it you know and who cares you know if i burn my own apartment you have insurance and you're going to build another one so they go into jamestown and they burn the governor's mansion and what does berkeley do he gets really scared <clears throat> he gets on a boat and he just kind of goes offshore now all of a sudden that night uh nathaniel bacon dies from the violent flux okay now what is the violent flux well a lot of people suspect that it was dysentery or dysentery i believe that he was poisoned like you don't get dysentery like overnight it, it, you know it's kind of progressive uh, <clears throat> i think that somebody poisoned them and he just got really bad stomach pangs and he got diarrhea and then and vomiting and he died of dehydration well once he dies the the rebellion kind of fizzles out and what happens is is that berkeley comes back so what does berkeley do exactly what he should not do he rounds up 23 of the, of the major perpetrator and he hangs them <laughs> I mean, it's just like he's making it worse. Instead of coming in and saying, okay, you know, I'm sorry, let's fix this. No, he hangs them. Now, let me tell you what's so important about Nathan's uh, rebellion or Bacon's rebellion, okay? <clears throat> it is at this point that the ruling class realizes that they cannot depend on the labor of white settlers anymore. Because when these settlers come over, they come over as indentured servants. But once they pay their debt, they're going to want land and they're going to want rights. And once you give these people land and rights, then you're going to have to give them equality. And the ruling class doesn't care if these people are white. They don't want them to have equal rights. So at the cornerstone of slavery, is bacon's rebellion because if you buy an african slave that is not considered to be even human then that's property you don't have to give that any right you purchase that human being which is horrible right and it's yours okay and and that's why bacon's rebellion is going to be so important the other reason that it's so important is that it shows the ruling classes what the masses can do all the death, destruction, fire, burning, looting, raping, all of this stuff that went on during Bacon's Rebellion demonstrates to them that they have to keep the masses content. you got to leave a little bit of meat on that bone in order to keep them occupied. The Mexican president, you know, uh, uh, Porfirio Diaz said, a dog with a bone neither barks or bites. Perro con hueso ni muerde ni ladra. So they figure out right away, you got to keep you got to keep them just above, above their head above water. And every once in a while allow one or two of them to make it to the top. But they're not like us, okay? And they're never going to be like the ruling class. But we have to make them feel like they are. If not, they're going to get really pissed off and then they're going to burn our stuff and we don't want that. Because the most important thing in the ruling class's lives is money. And, and that's it, you know. Uh, so remember that. Bacon's Rebellion is very important. It, it is extremely important. It is a catalyst in the uh, uh, slavery and in the precipitation of the American Revolution. Because eventually you're going you're gonna to have more poor people than you are going to have more rich people. Okay. Now the rhythms of the Ch Chesapeake... Um, and as I said before, it was a system of, of various and sundry goods. It was a very good system. Uh, by 1700, they're doing really good. They're not dying by the hundreds or anything like that. Now, remember what I, we talked about New England. Let's talk about New England again. You know, these guys, they're coming over here. They sell all their goods. They get on the Mayflower. They're, they're coming over here. The Speedwell, there's one of the ships called the Speedwell, uh, that was so leaky that I had to go back to get patched up and then they come back. And before they even get off the ship, they signed the Mayflower Compact. 
it, it's it's really it's not entirely democratic the the document but what they say is that if if you're not going to follow the rules and you just need to stay on the ship and go back to england okay we don't we don't want you here and this is a, these are the the settlers that were helped by squanto now what they don't tell you is that squanto came over and wanted help from uh the pilgrims because squanto's tribe was getting ganged up on by another indian tribe so they say, hey, if we help you guys out, will you uh, help us get rid of these Indians that are giving us some trouble? And that, that's the relationship that they have. But of course, then most of Squanto's tribe is wiped out by disease because, of course, they didn't know they had the pathogen. The death rate among Puritans was about 50% in the same year. And they were strictly business. Let's say, for example, that there's two Puritan families, right? And in this family, the wife died. And in this family, the husband died. And so they would say, well, you don't have a wife and I don't have a husband, so let's get married. So then they had, this guy had two kids and this lady had three kids. Now they have five kids. Then they would have three or four more kids together, right? And they had a huge family. The idea was to procreate as much as you could because you needed you needed the labor, okay? And... <clears throat> That was not an uncommon thing to do, you know. Uh, it was not. It wasn't shamed on. It's not like they liked each other before. It was just like, well, my wife died and your husband died, and I'm really lonely and you're really lonely, and you know we can make one farm and 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 we can have a couple of kids, and they that's it. Okay. Now most of these people are. Oh, this is where old money comes in America. Okay. Um, they they also had better living conditions the the winters are colder so that means that the disease carrying mosquitoes died uh more uh uh they were very patriarchal white patriarch uh and they brought the concept of land ownership and and introduced it to the indians the indians had no idea about land ownership okay it's like none whatsoever it's like what land ownership what's that um they were real sneaky with the Indians too. Maybe if I have time, I'll tell you something. <clears throat> they also farmed, uh, did a lot of timber. Uh, they would, uh, uh, they actually really helped with the deforestation of New England. They would get the tallest <clears throat> pine trees and they would send them to England so they could use make them for masts in the big ships. Uh, and they were all about passing on capital improvements. That's where we get it from. You know, Protestant guilt, when you call the work and you lie about being sick and then you feel guilty, that's Protestant guilt. You know, like you slept till noon and it's like, oh my God, I slept till noon. I wasted the whole day. You feel guilty because you didn't do anything. That's Protestant guilt, okay? That's where it comes from. Now, there was no social equality in New England, okay? Only white men. Uh, political participation was regulated and restricted to the saints, which were the church members. Uh, personal behavior was strictly regulated. They were the champions and the kings of shunning and ridicule, okay? That means that, you know, if they caught you doing something that you weren't supposed to, they put a dunce hat on you, cap on you, and they would parade you. If you, if you don't believe that that's true, read the book, The Scarlet Letter, okay? Uh, in addition to that, religious dissent was not tolerated. They came here in search of religious freedom, for themselves and nobody else, okay? Let's make that, let's get that straight, okay? Anybody that made any waves, be it a Catholic or a Quaker, they would hang you, okay? Um, there were people like Roger Williams and Anne Hutchison who do challenge the system and they can't hang them, so Roger Williams goes to Rhode Island and Anne Hutchison goes to Rhode Island eventually she goes to Rhode Island and then to Connecticut and then she ends up in New York where she uh, where the Indians catch up with her and they kill her and her 19 children and everybody says the reason that she died is because she strayed away from God well no she just ran across some bad Indians and they killed her they also create Harvard in 18 in 1636 so they could train their own ministers and educate the public the way they wanted to okay now, um, I do want you to, uh, Anne Hutchison, Thomas Hooker, his followers go to Connecticut, uh, and that's not where hookers come from, and then, of course, Roger Williams. So for those of you that don't know what you want to write about yet, those are three really good people to write about. 
uh, the the pilgrims were uh, champions in Indian in Indian suppression. They just kind of felt that the Indians weren't doing enough with the land, so they wanted to get rid of them. You know, they 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 felt that they were an impediment that were in their way, and one of the things that begins to happen as time progresses 1660s 1670s less and less individuals want to be part of that very conservative puritan church and they start breaking away and with the ushering in of the glorious revolution of charles ii james ii and william and mary then what you're going to have is that they're going to want to overthrow uh the people that are in power okay and that's when you get the salem witch trials the Salem Witch Trials in 1691 under William and Mary is the last episode of the Puritans struggling to hold on to power, okay? And where it goes out of hand is when they start uh, accusing uh, the governor's wife of being a witch. Uh, most of the, a lot of the women during the Salem Witch Trials do admit that they fabricated the stuff. The first person that's put to death, Tituba, does admit to being a witch but it, she wasn't a witch she actually practiced something to, like santeria that's another thing that you all can write about tituba or tituba right um and you know she makes these young girls you know uh, perform this ritual where they drink some concoction that had urine in it or something like that and then two other ladies that were just foul mouth you know and they're they were easy targets but you know in the salem witch trial you're gonna have daughters accuse their their parents and stuff like that so uh, read read about that you know that was that's that's why they call it a witch hunt okay uh so it really really uh, it, uh, new england is very important okay incredibly important simply and because it, it is it is the cornerstone of american colonies okay uh let's talk about uh the middle colonies and we're going to talk about New York really quick and New York is very diverse uh, uh, very diverse population uh, as it is now for those of you that don't know in Manhattan proper in New York City over 200 languages are spoken today okay and it is belongs to the Dutch but the Dutch don't do anything with it so uh, James the first takes it away from them but they don't do anything about it either it just kind of becomes this colony unprosperous but because it did. It didn't have any ties to religion, and it was so diverse. It becomes a. It becomes a center of trading. Okay. It didn't matter if you were Catholic and I was Protestant. We went to New York to trade our goods, and that's one of the reasons that you have Wall Street, and one of the reasons that it's still so incredibly diverse, because it was a. It was this just center of. It's not. Wasn't like the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, but it was this center of commerce where everybody went to do business whether they liked it or not it was also very dirty uh there was a lot of violence there uh but you know remember when the british come in during the revolution that's one of the first cities that they take they take new york and they somebody starts a fire and it burns you know and, and washington flees now uh pennsylvania is going to be a haven for quakers okay and <clears throat> Uh, what we're going to have here is William Penn uh, had loaned the uh, the crown a bunch of money. And they're like, you know, we're going to have to pay this guy sometime. And it's like, well, I don't know how we're going to pay him, you know. Uh, so they tell him, well, why don't you go ahead and go to the New World and you can have a big chunk of land over there. Also, you you practice this really weird religion that believes in the inner light, you know. Uh, it's a radical sect, S-E-C-T. Uh, so why don't you just go ahead and go over there now here's what happens okay the Quakers are pacifist they are even laid back with the Indians well because they're so laid back the colony attracts a bunch of other religions like you know Catholics and Amish and Lutherans and Mennonites and Baptists and you name it and they start giving the Quakers a bunch of grief and the Quakers just say like well you know what y'all go ahead and do what you want but we're not gonna we're not gonna fight with you all and we don't like the fact that you all are giving the Indians a bunch of crap because that's not cool so you know I know that I'm generalizing it a lot but <clears throat> what's gonna happen here 
is that it is going to become among the most prosperous colonies also because of that. It's also going to become the breadbasket of the colonies. They're, they're, what they're going to do is that they're going to produce cereals like rye, wheat, milo, sorghum, that kind of stuff. Okay, It's going to be the breadbasket of the colonies. And of course, it's going to be Philadelphia. It's kind of like in the middle. So <clears throat> they're going to go to Philadelphia to meet. It's kind of like a neutral ground. And all of them. everybody needs to go to Philadelphia at least once in your life, students. It's absolutely great. You see the Liberty Bell. You can see Independence Hall. Uh, you can all these wonderful things. You know. Did you all see that fly fly in my mouth? You can eat at City Tavern, <clears throat> and uh, so on and so forth. Okay. They have the First National Bank there. You name it. Uh, first Library. Um, okay. So. Diversity and prosperity spread among Pennsylvania, uh, and it is more successful than New England. Okay, uh, now let's. Uh, 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 we're running almost to 40 minutes, but I, I really need to just keep on going. Um, the Carolinas are is a serfdom. Okay, S E R F S, and the Carolinas are given to eight families. Okay, <clears throat> proprietors. Then they bring people over. These people farm and they give the people from the Carolinas a percentage of what they earn and then those people sell it. Now, what they do in the Carolinas also is they have naval stores. Stuff that comes out of the Caribbean is stored in uh, the Carolinas. Okay. Now, what kind of stuff do they raise in the Carolinas? Indigo, hemp, tobacco, rice and other sundry crops okay a lot of rice a lot of hemp to make rope pretty sure they smoke some of it too uh tobacco indigo that's a colorant that was used okay to make blue to make purple that kind of stuff but a lot of rice okay and a lot of tobacco in addition to that they stored things now the carolinas is important in a way in a bad way because they're the first colony that passes a law against slaves and it's this the in the 1740s they passed the south carolina negro act that denies slaves the freedom to move assemble raise food earn money read english any civil rights and severe punishments for any of the crimes that are committed okay so it pretty much what it's going to do is that it's going to keep african slaves at bay if you keep them illiterate then they're not going to be able to move forward okay and that that in itself is it's not going to be a good thing that we're going to have going the last colony that we're going to talk about is georgia you know a lot of us like to make fun of australia because it's a penal it was a penal colony but we have a penal colony too and it's called georgia now georgia was settled uh under the tutelage of james oglethorpe okay and that was a place for in, in prison debtors. They could put you in jail for not paying what you owed back then. I got a bug right there. Um, and the intention was to create a colony of small farmers. Now, everybody was cool with it because it was way down south and it was a buffer zone uh, between Florida and the colonies. And in Florida, you had the Spanish, okay? It was a military barrier. They weren't supposed to have slaves. They weren't supposed to distill alcohol. They weren't supposed to buy and sell land. But in 10 years, they're doing whatever they want. And Oglethorpe just throws up his hands and he leaves. All right. Now, uh, Georgia becomes a royal colony in 1752. And it closely resembles the Carolinas. Now, here's what stinks. What's really bad about Georgia. In the First Continental Congress, they do not allow Georgia to have any representatives at the First Continental Congress because they say those people are criminals. <clears throat> they don't have any business over here. And that's that's bad because even to that even to today, that still predates uh, uh, that's still present, I'm sorry, uh, in the United States. We still like to remind people about their past even though they paid their debt, and that is that's not good. That's called ad hominem hunting him attack to the person okay so uh now all of these colonies had something that they did the caribbean produced sugar the lower south rice tobacco indigo hemp the chesapeake centered on tobacco new england fishing timber 
shipbuilding and international commerce. A lot of this stuff went overseas. <clears throat> a lot of salted cod, a lot of whaling going on in New England. The middle colonies focused on cereals and overseas trade. And the back country, which I believe is the most important, settled on those sundry goods, on the variety of goods that made these colonies so incredibly great. You know, preserving, so, the, you know, uh, shoes, candles, you name it. I mean, all of those kind of things. They traded widely with each other, and they traded mostly with England, okay? Uh, <clears throat> you have a society and culture uh, that it's pretty much stuck to older values. The wealthy still believed in education and religion, uh, and they believed in land ownership and in capitalizing for future generations. Uh, you do begin to see uh, uh, the ushering in of slavery, where you have, you know, the the Middle Passage, and you have the English break the monopoly uh, from the from the Dutch, and you begin to have these ships that are called tight packers, uh, that where they pack uh, as many slaves as they can, bringing in anywhere between 900 to 1,200 slaves per ship. Um, and for the most part in the South, uh, African slaves outnumbered white colonists. You are going to have rebellions like the Stono Rebellion that's going to happen, uh, and later on Denmark Vesey. And you're going to have a lot of political, you're going to have a lot of social unrest in the areas of Philadelphia and New York, because they're the most tolerant. A lot of overcrowding, a lot of disease. You don't have any sanitation. You don't have any running water. You know, varied opportunities for employment. People don't want to move out into the hinterlands because they have no way of protecting themselves. A lot of urban and racial, a lot of urban racial tensions that are going on. Uh, and of course, the most, the thing that they were afraid of the most is slave uprisings. Okay. Life in the backcountry, uh, <clears throat> pretty much in the backcountry, you had regulators, you had militias that protected themselves, but these are almost as bad as the bandits because there were these, you know, marauding bands of, of men with guns that were only in it for themselves, and that's going to create a lot of problems as we see it. Now, what the, <clears throat> the, how I want to close is that The way I want to close, students, is, and, and I'm not, <clears throat> I like to keep it real, right? But I also don't want to bash it. I mean, these people came over here with pretty much the clothes on their back. I mean, they're living in the middle of nowhere. They had no clue what they were doing, and they survived, and they made it. You know, and I have nothing but admiration for them. But I have that same admiration for the settlers of the Southwest. And if you're interested in learning about them, then take my Mexican-American history class and we'll talk about them. But this is not the place to do so. Um, these 17th century colonies really had very little in common with each other, okay? And they had very little in common with England 20 years into it. By 1740, you're talking about 100 years, 1620, 1740, they've been here 100 years. That's five generations. They don't remember the king. The king is just, well, that's the king over there. They were feudal and they were visionary, okay? These individuals did what they could, and you've got to admire them for that. <clears throat> they weren't tolerant, but they didn't have to be. I mean, they were interested in surviving, and that was it. Now, one thing that I will say is when the time comes that they have to band together to overthrow the tyrant and this oppressor, they're going to do it. It's not going to be real easy, but they're going to do it. Okay, they're going to they're, they're gonna put their differences aside once they realize that this is the only way to do it. And they're going to fight the British. And that in itself is going to be a monumental task, you know. Up until recently, up until Vietnam, it was the longest war that the United States had fought in. Okay, it was eight years of fighting. So yeah, I mean the United States does have its problems, but it had its problems during its settling. The problems were there; they've always were always there. So sometimes we need to look past that 
and say, okay, well, how can we fix it? All right, but that's a story for another day. Again, if you like this really long lecture, which is 45 minutes long, make sure that you give me a thumbs up. Uh, you can share it if you want to and subscribe to my channel. And again, these views are my views and not those of Tarrant County College South Campus, okay? Recorded in the comfort of my shed in the great metropolis of Forest Hill. I'm just kidding. Take care, be kind to each other, and wear your mask.